Hey, it's uh, Jason Watt here from Business Career College, and the uh, results came down today for the November 2020 uh, CFP exam. And throughout this presentation, of course, we'll refer to CFP, and that is a registered trademark uh, of FP Canada. And when we refer to FP Canada, that's trademark of FP Canada. Okay. Um, so what happened here? Well, we'll have a look at the results and then we'll look at what happened if you passed. If you did, congratulations, great. Uh, if you failed and if you did, uh, sorry to hear it, it uh, breaks my heart every time I hear uh, from a student who was unsuccessful on the exam. Uh, results here are pretty good compared to what we see on average. Uh, so just under 900 people wrote. Uh, we had a 76% pass rate and sorry, I apologize, 73% pass rate for first time writers, 70% uh, for rewriters. That's uh, reassuring actually, I'm a big fan of that second number. That's or I guess what's on the screen here, my uh, fourth bullet point, but that's a lot better than we saw in the last exam. I was a little concerned with the last exam because the pass rate for people rewriting was very low. Uh, this gives me some reassurance that it's worth it to uh, write the exam a second time. So uh, for those that did fail, uh, I think you can be reassured that you have a realistic shot at prepping and getting through the exam when you rewrite uh, ideally in May. Overall, a 72% pass rate amongst the entire group of 878 writers. Okay, so if you did pass, again, congratulations. You'll get uh, some notification email from FP Canada. Until you get that, don't start using the CFP marks. Don't go change your business card, all that good stuff. I see this all the time. Uh, very specifically, the marks use guide from FP Canada, which I have the link to on the screen here. You won't be able to click on it. Uh, I'll try and put it in the description down below. Uh, but it does indicate very clearly that you do not use the CFP brand as part of your Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook name or anything like that. And uh, no rush for CE credits here. You may still need CE credits for other purposes, but from FP Canada, you don't have a CE requirement for 2021 or 2022, unless you bridged from the uh, PLFIM program, if you came from uh, the uh, Quebec program, and you just bridge to CFP, then yes, you still have your CE credit requirement. Um, if you want continued access to your course materials with BCC, if you happen to be one of our former students, you can sign up as a continuing education subscriber. I hope you'll learn something by doing it. And that gives you ongoing access at either $15 a month or $150 a year to our uh, core curriculum package. So if you want to brush up on concepts or stay current, that's a way to do it. Okay, now the bad news. So for those who failed, I would suggest that the first thing to do is to come to terms here with the fact that you're going to be writing the exam again. Okay. And I do get a lot of questions about whether it's worth it to pay for a regrade. The answer to that is almost certainly no. Uh, I have seen quite a few people pay for a regrade and I have never seen a result change by enough to make it worthwhile. I have seen a result change by, uh, so from a 490 to a 495, for example, it's automatically regraded anyways. If you score anywhere between 490 and 505, it's automatically regraded. If you scored a 480 or a 485, you, you're not gonna get bumped enough to make it worth it. Don't go spend the $300. It's not going to change your result. Okay, I hope that puts that at ease. I know that there's sort of that line dangling out there, but it is not worth it to pay for the regrade. Okay, so now, ideally, you're going to get yourself ready to write in May. Registration is open already. You can go book right now. I would think about what happened on the day you wrote as far as your level of comfort. If you wrote from home and it was not comfortable, maybe consider, can you write at an office this time around? I'm not sure yet what's going to happen as far as exam center writes. If that opportunity presents itself uh, and you want to write that way, great. But I do think it's worth looking at what happened on the day you wrote and what can change to make your experience better. 
Uh, if you were a BCC student who took an exam prep class with us, if you did the CFP exam, exam prep class with us, uh, we'll continue to welcome you back to that same exam prep class on a perpetual basis uh, until you pass the exam. I hope that that means only one more time. Obviously, we're not hoping to see people over and over again, but we do. And if you end up having to write a couple times, three times, then, well, that's life. That does happen. And that's a, a good overall message here is that I know it's difficult news to get that uh, the exam didn't go well, that you failed the exam. You're in good company here. Okay? It's not like there's some uh, magic bullet to pass the exam. And of the group that failed, this is going to represent intelligent and well-prepared people. There is nothing anybody can do to guarantee success on this exam. Now, that being said, in a couple of slides, I'll talk about what you can do to improve your odds next time around. I think you probably want to hear that, and I think that's an important message as well. Uh, you'll get a note from us about exam prep dates. We do have exam prep taking place currently. I want to be a little cautious here because if you're from one of our corporate clients uh, where you're not paying your way, where you have a, a bigger corporation paying your way, then this is going to depend a little bit more. Uh, that would be the same for reattending exam prep as well. I should be clear there that reattending re exam prep applies to those who paid their own way. We have different arrangements with some of our corporate clients. Uh, so what's happening here? Well, actually I already started back in January a half day per month. And we're doing this um, as a regular monthly session. Sorry, I started in February, I apologize. I started in February doing this as a regular monthly session. Uh, this is a good way to get started in studying. We have a small group right now. I'm sure we'll add to that group now that the results are out. Uh, but barring that, then we'll have the regular three-day prep starting in April and going into May, the ones that a lot of you did with us before. If you never attended an exam prep with us, uh, you might find that this makes the difference. Uh, there are certainly lots of other exam prep tools out there as well. And I do think it's worth looking around to find something that suits the, the type of study that is going to benefit you the best. I think that what you wanna ask yourself here is, what am I hoping to get out of studying and what exam prep tool is going to match that desired outcome? I, I get a lot of questions about what the results look like, and they are not honestly very helpful. The results that FP Canada provides for most people probably don't give you enough tools to know what you have to do to expect to succeed the next time around. So this is a, an excerpt of somebody's results from this exam. Uh, all confidential, no student information is in here, uh, but you'll see that uh, orange bar at the top right. And what you need here is to get 500 or greater. I'm guessing here, but just based on the percentage of people that passed, that 72% uh, of people passed, I'm gonna guess that the average was probably about a 530. So the pass at about 500, average probably about 530. It's normally a standard deviation of about 60 or 70. Uh, I'm gonna go with 70 here just for the sake of argument. So if you're in that 460 to 500 range, and really 460 to 530, but at that point you passed the exam if you're between 500 and 530, so that puts you in that first standard deviation. And by the way, if you don't know what I'm talking about when I talk about standard deviation, that's an examinable concept. You can go review that in chapter five of core curriculum. This is probably a case then where if you're in that sort of 460 to 500 range, that you just need some brush up. Just do more of what you did last time, a little bit better study, maybe start studying now, maybe a little bit more diligent with your study, and maybe pay a little bit more attention to having a, a fully developed strategy on exam day. I'll talk about that on the next slide. If you're less than 460, that's where a lot more work is required. I find for students who start off at a mark less than about 460, it's very unusual to see somebody go from that mark uh, to a pass. It normally is an incremental improvement here where I'll see somebody who scored maybe a 430 or 440 and that person scores a 480 or 490. That's the kind of improvement that you need 
And if that's the case, great. That being said, if you scored less than 460, you have to be realistic about what to expect next time around and about your needed level of effort. This means that you do almost need to go relearn core curriculum, in my opinion. Okay, then there's the bottom half, or I guess the bottom 10 rows here, but the, the sort of top half is the overall score. And if you scored over 500 there, you probably don't care about what's in the bottom half. Uh, and you don't get that feedback anyways for a passing result on CFP exam. So the bottom half has the 10 categories. This is a little bit confusing. A 20 is the passing, the average score for passing exam writers. So it's gonna skew a little bit to the right. If you took all the passing writers, you'd see a bunch of marks to the right of 20. For somebody who scored a, a 490, as is the case here, that person is left of all the passing results. And this is normal. Now, if you're seeing marks that are sort of 15 and up, it doesn't mean anything. It's honestly just not helpful. Between 12 and 15, maybe there's a little bit of utility here but even that's dicey. Uh, the problem here is the sample size is very small. You're dealing with just too few questions and not enough information to tell you if that 12 to 15 really means anything. If you scored less than a 12, then that probably tells you that that's an area to brush up on. Now for this particular person, uh, that analysis result you can see is just over 12. Usually when there's a lower analysis score, that's a strong indicator that the student brought a lot of bias to the exam, that maybe they didn't fully work through the concepts, maybe they jumped to conclusions a little bit too much. I don't know that for sure, but that's my guess when I see a student who scored low on analysis. And this person also scored low on recommendation, which probably reinforces my judgment here. Usually when collection is low, that's an indicator uh, that the student didn't read the questions well enough. Okay, but again, that's a hard tool to get any value out of. And usually when somebody sends me their uh, exam feedback score, I say, look, we can't really learn anything useful from it. You just have to get back to the books and study. Okay, so what comes next? And this is where it's worth having a look at, sorry, camera problem here. worth having a look at uh, what you're going to do from this point on, okay? So you're going to put in uh, 40 or 50 minutes per day. This is a little more than I normally prescribe, but I've actually been doing a little bit of research into this lately, and I think this is the ideal thing. You should block this in your calendar right now. So go open your Outlook calendar and block, let's say 7.30 to 7.50 every morning and maybe 8.30 to 8.50 every evening, something like that, two sort of 20 or 25 minute blocks. And you're going to study in those two windows, okay? You're going to uh, use the 130 day study schedule if you're not sure what else to study. This is not a definitive guide of what to study. It's really designed because I find most students otherwise don't know what to study. You can download it from just below here. Find yourself a study mm -hmm. partner. If you didn't previously work with a study partner, find somebody, uh, it might be somebody local to you, it might be somebody in your same firm. If you are a BCC student, you can go post in the discussion forum. I see people do this sometimes and tee up with a study partner. And what you wanna do here is the both of you use the same study material. So you might both use the BCC practice questions or you might both buy from a different prep provider, but you both buy that package and then you swap answers. So you do the question yourself, your partner does the question on their own, then you swap, grade each other. And this is a way to help address that bias, that dreaded bias that shows up so much on the exam otherwise. And then after you've graded each other, then go over your results together. But it's important that you don't self-assess your exams. This is actually, in my opinion, harmful and it will re reinforce bias. Okay, and then we want to think about what happens in the exam. So did you write down your uh, time management and exam writing strategy? Did you jot those things down? And I'm a big fan of taking two or three minutes in your first 
couple of minutes in that two hour block of writing those things down. Did you take proper care of your body and your brain for that matter? Diet, exercise, sleep, hydration, meditation in the couple of weeks prior to the exam? Did you relax the day before the exam? Did you sleep well the night prior? Is there anything you can do to change that for this coming exam? And did you participate? And by participate, I mean actively participate in the exam prep class. That is, did you show up with questions already done? I find this is honestly a source of frustration for me is we try to give students lots of notice that there's this homework to do. And then I find it's typically sort of a small subset of students who actively participate. I think everybody benefits from this. And I know it can feel like you're being judged. And I guess to some extent that's true, but in the end, only you will remember the specific feedback that you got about a question in class. I don't remember which students got which kind of feedback. I just appreciate when students participate because I think they learn more from it. Okay, so I hope that next time around brings you better luck. Thanks very much for watching the video and enjoy your continued studies.